Lola Akimande Akastrom does a lot. She's a writer, speaker, and entrepreneur, but she's probably most known for her photography. Lola has been featured in some of the biggest magazines out there, including National Geographic, Travel and Leisure, Forbes, and more. And what is clear in all of her endeavors is that at her core, she's a storyteller. Whether it's with photos, writing, or speaking, you can see the influence of the cross-cultural life that she has lived and how it shapes the narratives that she shares. In this episode, you'll hear about the two big moves that have impacted her adult life. The first was leaving her native Nigeria at age 15 to study in the United States. And the second was her move to Stockholm, Sweden. Well, because she fell in love with a man who is now her husband. During this conversation, we explore the nuances of Swedish culture and identity and the amazing benefits and frustrating challenges that come with it, especially for foreigners. She also shares how she made the intentional transition from being a programmer to becoming a full-time creative entrepreneur. And most importantly, she discusses her two latest projects that she has been working on meticulously for the past year or so. The first being the local purse, which was born out of a need to support merchants who had been devastated by the loss of income during the COVID pandemic. And the second, which is her latest book, In Every Mirror, She's Black, where she looks at being a foreigner through the eyes of three distinct characters. We first featured Lola in 2018 on the Black Expat site. And as you'll soon hear, so much has changed in a lot of amazing ways. Welcome to the Global Chatter. So let me ask you, how long have you lived in Sweden? So going on 11 years now. Okay. Yes. And and yes. what what initially brought you to Sweden? So a man brought me to Sweden. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> because, yeah, exactly. Because I'm like, I was sitting up in the US. <laughs> before I, right. No, but um, I, I met my husband, now husband, in tw- uh, 2006. Mm-hmm. And at the time I was living in the US, he was living in Sweden. We actually met online just randomly. And and then for the next three years, we traveled back and forth. Mm-hmm. And at the time I used to work as a programmer, mm-hmm. software developer. So my company allowed me to kind of go for three months, come back for three months. So that was actually what really wow. um, gave the relationship space to grow. Yeah. And, uh, and then the rest is history. I remember in 2006, we met online, which back then there was so much stigma right. attached to us. Especially, <laughs> especially you guys being international, because there's stigma yes, if you're, yes. let's say you're in the States and so it's a city over or a state over. Exactly. But you're like time I zones. <laughs> I know, time zones. And, and the thing was, I wasn't even because it was on Match.com, you know, and back then I was living in the DC area, uh-huh. just in um, Alexandria. And I was like, I like to travel. Yeah. Is there. And, and there was a, at that time there was a Match.com International. I'm like, okay, why not? So why not just put my profile there and see? And I mean, coming from Nigeria back then, my parents right. were like, oh my god, oh, what are you doing online? What is going on? Oh, you're supposed to be somebody in church, right, exactly in somebody. church. First of all. So you can imagine back then, but you know, today I'm so grateful because back then people are actually more serious, mm-hmm. you know, because it was. Like, I need to find somebody where I don't waste two weeks of my time yeah. finding out we have nothing in common. Yeah. Then, but nowadays, I could not do it. Like, it's quite a swipe. Like, I don't know. It's so stressful. It's, it's, it's so stressful. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, and, and what's real funny is that I'm, I'm even, I'm hearing, I haven't even met your parents, but I'm hearing their voices in the back of my head because I know exactly how this plays out. And, and it's funny because... In a lot of West Africa, and I'm not going to speak for the rest of Africa, but I know a lot of West African cultures, right? They're not opposed to matchmaking. 
They're not opposed to someone saying, oh, I have this child. I have this son. You two shoot. They are both in America. You both are, you know, he's a doctor, whatever. But like, but it's real interesting when you take it to the internet. You're like, well, it's algorithms and and they don't understand that part. Yeah, no. So, I mean, now obviously they're on board. But back then, you can imagine because when people at that time, when they said you met somebody online, they thought, you are just writing and that was yeah. like, yes, you just meet them, but then you actually talk, you meet you. Like, it's actually a really, like, it's life, real life. It's not that, right. <laughs> that you're talking to a bot, you know, like a, you know, you a bot online and be like, you know, I met somebody. So, but I'm so, I mean, it's been amazing to just see how over the years, just this whole, you know, kind of meeting new way of meeting people has really evolved. You know, and 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 it's a new norm, yeah. and I think it's actually a real great way of meeting people. So. And are you so obviously Nigerian background? What I read that you came to the U.S. around the age of fifteen. So did you spend yes. up until the age of fifteen living in Nigeria, or did your family live somewhere else as well? Yeah, so we lived. I lived up until fifteen in Nigeria. I mean, we traveled mm-hmm. a lot. You know, we were traveling family in terms of just vacations and. And my dad at the time worked for a company that was based in Italy, so we traveled mm. a lot too. But but I lived in Nigeria up until I was 15. And I at 15, I was actually done with high school, mm-hmm. with boarding school and all that. And so when I moved to the U.S., I went, I started college. So. And so where did where did you come in the U.S.? I went to Maryland. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, as, as all good Cowboy West Africans Boy. go, they go to the, D- exactly. the DMV like the area. <laughs> and I was, I said this on another podcast, and I'm going to repeat it. I was like, either they go to the DMV, if they have a cousin, they go to Houston. Yes. Maybe they might go to Chicago, but that cold weather is, mm. and then. Um. Debatable. And then there's that weird crowd that goes to California that I don't know them. Exactly. I'm New York. Uh, uh, New York is the other one. New York is the other one. Exactly. So New York, California, man, Texas, and then DMV. But the DMV, DMV. no, because my parents came in the 70s. So, so like yeah. all the migrations <laughs> I've seen. But so you you came to Maryland, and I'm I'm curious what was because I when I returned back to the U.S. So I lived. Uh, ten, ages ten to seventeen in Cameroon. When I came back at seventeen, I came by myself. So my parent, my family was not here except for you know you have like aunts and uncles in in different places. Yeah. And so I had a really hard adjustment. I'm very curious because you were also a teenager coming to the U.S. and I don't know you didn't come with parents yeah. either, right? No, no, I didn't come with parents, but I came and I stayed with my uncle and my mm-hmm. aunt for two years. Mm-hmm. And so I moved out <laughs> when I was seventeen. Mm-hmm from them and and so since then I've actually been living on my own I uh, at a very young age I've been uh I don't know what kind of responsible in terms of I've been acting like an adult from a very younger like a young age so when I moved out at 17 then I was living you know on my own going to college I graduated um undergrad at 19 Mm -hmm. started working right away Mm -hmm. you know for uh, as a programmer so I think all through my 20s, I was like the most boring kind of just 20-year-old mm-hmm. acting like I was 40. <laughs> right. And I'm, and I'm like, in hindsight, hmm, I should have just played around and just had fun. <laughs> and, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but, my, but back then I was really, you know, so I, so I kind of grew up quickly and I already started um, kind of walking in just – as an adult, just with an adult mentality from a very young age. So. Mm. And were you, um, are you the, and I'm always curious by this, were you the oldest, only, middle, youngest? Can you guess? I mean, you sound responsible. I feel like you're the oldest, but. <laughs> yes, I am. Because <laughs> I have an older sister. This is why I know. I'm like. Yes. <laughs> my, exactly. So I am the oldest. I was, like, I was like, she came, she stayed with her auntie yes. and uncle. She went to school and she worked yes. and did not get in any trouble. I'm like, that one is the exactly. oldest child. <laughs> that is the oldest child. So, yes, I am. I was like, if you've been the youngest one, this is where we hear, as they say, oh. all the atrocities <laughs> came from the, exactly from the right. youngest. <laughs> how, how many siblings do you have? Uh, I have three sisters, yeah. three close sisters. Very yeah. cool. And so, obviously, you started your career very young. And I don't know how many people know this, like, because we're going to get into all the stuff that you do now. So, you were a programmer for what, probably a decade? Less than a decade? Yeah, at least, at least a decade, yes. Wow. I was a programmer and system active, yeah. Wow. And so, what was that just an interest of yours as, as a young person, or you, you saw it as a lucrative career and just kind of went into it, or what happened? 
No, it was pretty much the career my parents would okay, pay for. Okay, that's the question I was also getting to. That's very African. That's very African. It was like, because, because I, wanted to, I wanted to be a geologist, you know, like my dad. Um, uh-huh. You know, um, I was really into geography and just that was my subject. And they're like, you know what? It's not, it may not be the best career field for you, you know, maybe as a woman, I don't know, can you try something that will be more lucrative? And I'm like, but I need to at least get geography in there somehow. So I, so my degree was in information systems and geography Mm -hmm. and my uh, uh, master's was in information systems as well. But then I started working with something called geographic information systems, Mm -hmm. which is pretty much interactive maps, like Think of Google yeah. Maps, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that was the kind of programming I was doing where it was still at still had to do with, you know, being looking at things spatially and maps and stuff like that. So so I so I really enjoyed my life as a programmer. So it wasn't like I didn't like it. I actually really did enjoy that field in uh, geographic information systems. I mean, I, and I, I know we're laughing as, as you were talking about your response early on, but I think you touch on something that is... I think it's the struggle of many an immigrant kid, depending on what kind of parents you have. Right. Um, Mm. What, you know, we want to go to school. They want you to go to school and you, and you completely Mm. understand, especially from the countries and communities they come from. But then this tension of, if you have a kid who wants to do something that they don't know Mm. (laughs) or they can't, They can't conceive of it because they just don't, you know what I mean? Because Hmm. what do we always say? If you're coming, you know, you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. Um, Is there any other option? uh, Because I really feel like... (laughs) Oh, oh, as my friend, uh, Gloria and Tamu, Gloria, you need to meet. She she, uh, she usually says that or or failure. It's like if you're not... Gloria's amazing. You need to follow her. Or or accountant, depending on depending on who it is. Like, there's all... I've met more... African accountants, <laughs> and I was like, well, um, "How are you all account?" Anyway, don't get me started because. Yeah. Yeah. But but you see, but the great thing though is that it's it's that generation is changing, right? So it's my parents' generation, and even they have come on board, right? They've like over the years they've seen that you know what I see my children happy doing something else, so they are on board. And then with this new generation, mm-hmm. you know, our, our generation, then it's not an issue anymore. Mm-hmm. So it it kind of started from we've struggled so hard. Mm-hmm. You have to do something that makes the return on investment yeah. worth it. Yep. You know, so, and, and so it's always tied to just knowing that we have, as Africans, we had back then anyway, we have so much to prove to the world. We have to show that we are this, we are that, we are capable, mm-hmm. of, you know. And now a lot of that pressure is slowly going away because I always say that, you know, once uh, Africans, or, and I don't want to speak generally, yeah. But I can say maybe once West Africans or maybe once Nigerians start disassociating success with material mm, things, preach. <laughs> then you can imagine how amazing um, we will all, we could all be as a society mm. where somebody can be like, you know what, I'm a poet and I'm thriving and I'm amazing and I'm successful or I am this and I'm thriving and I'm happy, but it doesn't have to tie to like, I have three PhDs. My God. And, and. You know, and the house and the car. And so once we start disassociating some of those things, I think there'll be a lot of people that will feel like they can live their true purpose, step into themselves and fully show up as themselves in the world. I mean, I, I this is something that's always at the forefront of my mind because, I, and I don't know if you know this, but I'm a career counselor by training and trade. Mm. And I have conversations all the time, not so much in my current role, but for the past 10 years with young people who, particularly those who come from an immigrant background, who have that struggle where they're like, you know, Mm. mom and dad want me to be this doctor. Mom and dad want me to be this. I have a love for literature. I have a love for the arts. Right. Mm. And, and you're right. I think, I think part of it is our parents' generation I mean, let's think about it. I have no idea how old your parents are, but let's think, of, you know, my, my, my mother saw the end of colonialism in her mm, life. Mm, right. Mm. So she was a, she was a preteen teenager <laughs> when her country, mm. at least in name anyway, no longer was a colony. 
And so if we think yes. about the hope that many of these these folks grew up who had the chance to go out and see things, you know what I mean? Like the hope that they have yeah. for their children, like I get it, but I think you're right yeah. that we, and I'm still trying to unpack the materialism part, right? Because let's let's yeah. be honest, like there is nothing like an African show showing when they want to show, like. <laughs> like, have you been to, have been to a Nigerian wedding? Right, right? I was, <laughs> many, many a West African wedding, and I'm like, exactly. you know, yeah. and and I'm thinking to myself, but why, why do we have to associate? You know, like, why do we have to so much associate what our children do with my child's an engineer? Like, I've been at parties. Yes. And someone would talk all day long about how this person is an engineer and they're doing this. And and I get the pride, Mm -hmm. but then what is the pressure we put on our, on our, specifically our African children and young people who they don't fit into that? Because here's the thing too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you always say, I used to tell this joke because my mother, man, my mother makes me laugh. I'm like, everybody (laughs) always says they took first. Everybody says, like, okay, I took first. So, okay, who took, I'm like, who took last? That parent is the parent exactly. that I want to know. Because I was like, you know, in my class, I was first. I was like, were you? Exactly. <laughs> were you? <laughs> first and what? But, but, but you see, but you know, I don't know if you know this phrase, but there's actually a phrase that says, Niger know they carry last. Yes. Where is a uh, Nigerian thing where it's like, Nigerians don't come last. Yes, never. Everything, you know. <laughs> Yeah, ever, ever, you know, we, we all cross the finish line all in one line, you know, horizontal line together, and never like. But, but it's, you know, but, but I think a lot of that is also dissipating, and, and it's a good thing because it's releasing a lot of the pressure. Mm-hmm. And like I said, you know, with our generation where people are just doing, thriving, they're fashion designers, they're artists, they're just living. And I think there's a new mindset around that, you know, and, and even with my mom, I mean, she's my biggest supporter now, but I remember when I quit being a programmer yeah. and said I wanted to be a photographer, <laughs> she's like, please, just remind everybody you have degrees. <laughs> <That's all." laughs> just remind them when you produce yourself. <laughs> because, you know, what we can't forget, I'm laughing, but what we can't forget is that yeah, part of the reason the parents also there is that pressure on the children, but the parents are also in these groups, and you know, and, and, yes. and they don't want to be the one explaining, especially when they can't really explain what you're doing either, because that part is really exactly. funny when they're like, yeah, exactly. yeah, they don't, they don't want to be. It's not like they're ashamed of yeah. you, but they're like, no, 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 they're like, how am I going to explain that? How am I going to explain that my daughter is an influencer? So I don't know. I'll be like, just, just random things like that. You know what? But, I still uh, want to show on that. I literally want to show where. Like different Africans <laughs> trying to explain to their parents <laughs> and their grandparents exactly. what an influencer. And then and then because I can hear I can hear somebody talking in the dialect where they're just trying to figure it out and they're like influ influ what it, eh? exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like, you know I love I love oh, but Africans are the best. No, I do. I, I think that for for all the problems. <laughs> And all the faults, some of the best stories I will I oh. come off that continent because people are funny. Like and and yes. they don't and the best part is too, they don't hide their emotions. Like they're very like <laughs> if they don't know, it's on their face and it's on their yes. like it's in the language. And so I, I love it. And so I hmm. so I'm I'm curious as someone who has obviously you grew up in Nigeria, you lived in the US for a long time, you moved to Sweden. What was that transition for you now leave, leaving the U.S. and going to, to Stockholm? Like, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, it's a big culture shock. I mean, living in three kind of very vibrant, very different cultures, you know. And for me, I've always been somebody that culture underpins everything I do. So cultural connection, that's my, my work. I mean, growing up in Nigeria, it's 250 different tribes speaking over 500 different dialects. I mean, so for me, it's always about cultural understanding and trying to figure out bridges of understanding, right? And then for me, being able to kind of transition and get beneath the underbelly of a culture Mm. is about how does a culture handle stress? Mm. Because Because once you figure out how a culture can handle stress, then you can start beginning to understand the mindset of that culture. So U.S. to Sweden was a big kind of culture shock mm. because um, because the U.S. 
I mean, as you know, living in the U.S., there are very different um, ways of being stressed. So the U.S. tries to camouflage stress, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So the U.S. says we need to just create the most innovative solutions to camouflage to camouflage this stress in our lives because we're not going to get rid of it because we still need to be productive. Right. So what are some of these innovative? Yeah, so we need to keep moving forward. So what can we do to keep the stress at bay? We need solutions. So the U.S. is a very innovative kind of creative culture in that sense. Yeah. In Sweden, for Sweden to kind of move forward, they need to take care of the stress first <laughs> before they can move forward. And so when you think of stress, you think of your physiological needs, your basic needs, things that will stress you in life. Yeah. You know, um, healthcare, food, education, just basic needs. So the Swedish mindset is we need to take care of those stress factors first so we can actually move forward and be productive. And that's why when you think of all the Nordics where they've got like really kind of, they've put systems in place, you know, healthcare, free education, you know, um, parental leave, things to kind of alleviate physiological-based stress so that they can actually operate. Whereas the U.S. has more creative solutions for those stress things because and, and keeps moving anyway. Uh. So so there are many things. And then with Nigeria, mm-hmm. it's like stress will always be there, so you might as well live your right. life like it's the last day. <laughs> I was, I was waiting for the, what's the Nigerian solution? Because if it's like the Cameroonian solution, it's like, well, it's there, and... <laughs> it's not going anywhere. So better live your life, right. you know? So, 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 that's what, so, that, so what I've done, you know, by living in these three different cultures is that you can create your own super culture by pulling the best of all three, right? So with Nigeria, pull that vibrancy, yeah. that sense of community and enjoyment and living in the now, adding that to that kind of American uh, innovative and drive and, and just keep moving forward and then pull in some of the Swedish balance, you know, where things need to at least be balanced. You can start creating your own super culture for yourself, you know, and that's kind of what I've personally done in my own life, you know, pull the best of all three and, cultures. And that's a beautiful way. I mean, I... I don't know if we often think about to the depth of where we look at a culture and say, let's look at the best of how, or let's compare, but let's compare critically Mm. in a way that isn't always from a negative standpoint. Let's just see also what are the good things and how can I implement that where I go? And so I I guess a question I always, it's always in the back of my mind and I've been an expat and obviously you, you have is even with that, how do you, critically, like you live in Sweden. Sweden is not a utopia as much as some Americans think. (laughs) Americans are convinced Scandinavia is the model for everything that we, that Americans should do. Um, Mm. But how do you look at a culture, which you you also recognize, and you talked about this with COVID, um, where you're living there and you, you, you embrace it, but there's also, there's some things that you know that maybe they don't do so well. And how do you be a, yeah. how do you comfortably criticize somewhere where you're not from, but you're in? Correct. 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 Well, first of all, if you're paying off your taxes to them, like you, <laughs> you have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> you can't criticize. Oh, no, but really, I mean, I, I do love Sweden. I mean, it's my new home, you know, and like with any place you love, anybody you love, you should be able to at least criticize gently with solutions, yeah. right? Or with, And so when I look at the best parts of Sweden, there's this whole mindset to, that they talk about logum, logum. A lot of Swedes don't like it because they feel it's constrictive because it's this mindset of balance where everybody should be harmonious or the same. But what have they de- constructed kind of objectively is it's a mindset that tries to remove stress out of your life. Okay. So it's a stress within your control out of your life. So if you think of your life as a scale, right? Too much stress is it too little. So it tries to find those kind of habits that you can sustain every day. So those that scale stays balanced. Mm-hmm. In your personal life, that's a good thing, right? Because it's trying to remove stress. It's trying to minimize things. It's trying to make sure you have work-life balance, take care of your health, get enough rest, declutter your own, create sustainable habits, great. But in a group setting, Mm -hmm. it tries to do the same thing. It tries to remove stress. 
and anything that's seen as stress in a group setting, differences, conflict, you know, mm-hmm. it tries to naturally do what it does in a personal life. And that's where the um, negatives come, where it says it's trying to make everybody the same mm. by trying to remove stress points. Like you're very different, but if you tone down, then you won't stress me, then we're all harmonious. So it's kind of going into the culture and truly understanding, okay, this is a good thing because the ethos itself is a good ethos, but it acts differently in different situations. Mm. Personally, it's great. In a group setting, it's not. So when you think of it real quick, when I say my logum, that means my personal skill, right? My personal balance. It can be different from your own skill. Mm -hmm. But your skill is perfect for you because you you create your own balance for you. Mm -hmm. It's allowed to make you live your best life. That's what it's trying to do. Mm -hmm. Well, now, if you come into a group and I come into a group and I see you living your best life, right? And your best life can stress me because your best life is better than my own best life. (laughs) That's when I try to bring you down to try and make us equal or try to keep us. So that's the problem. That's the dichotomy of this whole mindset is that personally, it tries to make you live your best life. By, cre- by creating a life you can sustain mm. in a kind of effortless way. But then that means you could be operating at a different level than somebody, but when you meet in a group setting, mm-hmm. that's where the stress comes. And then we try to, okay, you're, you're, you're thriving too much. Come down with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know what? You have just given a perfect segue, um, which I would like to pick up in the second part of this, specifically about your experiences as a Black woman, because I know that for some of our our listeners, as they look at different parts of the world and try to understand and just want to learn about different cultures, I want to get into your particular nuances as someone who identifies as Black, and then really get into some of the amazing, beautiful work that you're doing, especially in a time where we're trying to deal with a pandemic. So after the break, we're going to pick up from there. Mental wellness is a big part of a successful expat experience, whether you're going abroad for a short stint or making the move long term. This is why you should visit the International Therapist Directory. It provides online listings of professional mental health therapists who are familiar with the expat as well as the third culture kid life. With over 250 members in more than 35 different countries, this resource lists therapists, counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists interested in providing culturally sensitive, cross-cultural treatment and care for today's expat community. Visit internationaltherapistdirectory.com to find out more about this global therapy resource. So I want to pick up, as I said in the last segment, about uh, your experiences as a Black individual living in Sweden. I know that, you know, especially when we or when I talk to Black and brown folks who are in some areas where people don't necessarily commonly think of there being Black populations or brown populations there, they always kind of go, hey, I wonder what what that person's experience is. And so... um, what are some of the nuances that, that you've seen living as someone who's Black? And, and I know that you are also a parent. And so having mm. to navigate kind of, you know, raising a child of color in, in Stockholm. Yes, no, so absolutely. So one of the things I've always said, I mean, like I said, I, I really enjoy living in Sweden. It's you can thrive if you really kind of have your space and push to thrive. But the main difference for me is this. In the U.S., as crazy as the racial tension is, you're fighting your enemy in daylight. You know what you're fighting. Mm -hmm. It's out in the open. Mm -hmm. And your enemy also believes you could be like Oprah Winfrey. (laughs) Like I can be like that, Oprah Winfrey, right, in the U.S. But in Sweden, it's, it's it's, it's a kind of subtle racism where people will leave you alone. You're going to be comfortable in a corner, complacent in a corner, enjoy your life in a corner, but the minute you come out of your corner and decide you want to be the CEO of uh, Ericsson mm-hmm. or Ikea, or like one of, that's where everything kind of, because you're like, why do you need to be here? Didn't we just put you in a corner uh. with a box? So that's a kind of 
um, the, the nuance, the difference. Or, for example, like I always say that if in the U.S., at least the person, the racist believes I'm a doctor, but in Sweden, it's more of like, oh, wow, you're a doctor. Oh, you must be really smart then. Like it's a very mm. it's a passive. kind of unconscious. Yeah. It's a passive kind of unconscious bias. And I mean, really great people, but they are, but it's a kind of the ones that are really racist, very, <laughs> it's insidious, but also it's a kind of unconscious bias that says this is where you are mm. and you shouldn't leave this space. Mm. And how dare you try to tr- want to try for coming to my space? So it's a country that creates a lot of isolation. People, a lot of people feel isolated and put in sections, mm. like they feel they can cross over. There are a lot of foreigners that don't have a lot of Swedish friends mm. because it's an insular society. Mm-hmm. I always say I call it the most open society run by the most private people. Mm. <laughs> so it's open. You can do whatever you want. Just don't come to my house, right. <laughs> and you can do it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not that's kind of like me now. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the thing, though. And, and so and so for a black woman, it's more of a, the first thing you meet is an unconscious bias, mm. which says um, you are here because I let you here, so you should forever be grateful. Mm. And then now I know best, so let me explain how things work for you. And so that's actually what I, why I wrote a book. It's coming out very soon about three different black women in Sweden mm. because it's going to show that they're all battling the same thing, but one in career, one in class, and then the other with culture, yeah. you know, and showing that the black experience is very different. But in Sweden, it's always kind of bundled as you're just a foreigner, so you're supposed to do this, you know. Yeah. And and so that's uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's very different, but the advantage that I feel I bring is that I lived in the U.S. before coming to Sweden. Mm. So I recognize, like right away, when that kind of boxing happens, I'm like, if they didn't box me in the U.S., I'm not. You're not going to do it, <laughs> like because I've, I, you know, you recognize it right away. So. So it's very so that's a difference. It's very and and again this cultural thing because it's like uh, if you're an assertive person, it's kind of intimidating to people. They they see it as aggressive. Everybody needs to be mellow and calm and or the, you know. So it's so there are so many cultural elements to it as well. Um, but I would say it's to be a, to be a black woman like Oprah Winfrey in Sweden can be damn near impossible. Yeah. Like it is very, it's a culture that is very, um, this is your, your year, you're a foreigner, you're this, so just stay right here. And I, I recently wrote an article for the New York Times. Mm-hmm. I saw it. Talking about, yeah, no, talking about, you know, raising my daughter. And that article kind of gave insight into the mentality where um, when, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter happened in the US. Mm-hmm. And so... My my daughter's friends were coming to her to say, "Oh, you should protect your mom. Protect your mom." You know, she's like, "Why? Like, because your mom is black. You should protect your mom." And then they kept coming, like, "Oh, we're going to protect you. We're going to protect you." And I'm like, "They don't need to protect you, because." And then I'm like, "What are the conversations being had in those homes? Because they because they feel like we are the white saviors to protect black people because they have no agency." You know, and that's the mentality because it's a great country that does great things humanitarian wise, but that is it. It's it's the ultimate white savior yeah. mentality where we we know best, so we're gonna come in and take care of you best. Yeah. So you can come here and then just stay in this corner because we're taking care of you in a corner. And then if you try to come out of that box, then you're like you're being ungrateful. Why don't you just stay in your box? Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a very nuanced kind of problem and issue here but um and then of course there's the right wing the right wing mm-hmm. that's rising as well you know and yeah it, it's it's a very kind of passive aggressive racism that's very gaslighting and also um a lot of unconscious bias or conscious bias rather you know so. so uh two things i want to point out one's a question one is just in reflection of what you just said is that um I never realized it, but 
until you said it, but it's true. I think if you have had the experience of being black in the U.S., it kind of preps you <laughs> if you go to other places, right? And in in some ways, maybe unconsciously, it kind of toughens you. Yeah. Because yes. one thing I will say is that having seen Black folks who have had some kind of relationship with the United States, however it is, however they've lived here, whether they were immigrants or their families have been here 10 generations, is that when you go somewhere else and you see ridiculousness and you know it's based on, you're yes. being received based on your Blackness, they're not going to roll with it. And sometimes if they're seeing ridiculousness happening to other Black people. <laughs> <laughs> they often are the ones who are comfortable calling it out because that's what you do here. Like <laughs> as much as you can, you know, it's not 1928. So <laughs> as much as black people can, they can be like, you racist, even if you didn't think you were racist, you racist. <laughs> and, and, and so until you said it, I was like, yeah, I do think that that for a number of black folks, when they leave here and they go to other places, they can spot it. It's like a, it's your spidey sense. Like, you're like, yeah. you just know. Yeah, it's, it's covert, yeah, it's whether it's covert, passive, aggressive, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is that you, you've got that radar and then you also have to sift it with the cultural right. nuances, right? right? Because I have a couple of friends in the U.S. that are very, um, um, you know, like we have different ways of approaching, you know, like injustice and racism, mm-hmm. and they are very like this. It's it's just this one way, yeah. you know. And and then I'm like, but the one way doesn't work in this culture. Right. You actually have to figure out the cultural how the culture works, and then and do right. your approach. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Like it doesn't like you can't take the same American mentality and of say course. it must work here. It, it must work, work here. It absolutely. Must work here. As a black person, you have to first figure it out. Now, what I've done with um like just coming to Sweden and writing that book, a lot of people are just, when they first they're banging your heads. And then when you kind of unwrap the culture, you're like, oh, this is it. Oh, so I could just actually walk around the wall and keep moving, right? So that's the walking around the wall, understanding these are the cultural things. It's going to take centuries to to break down, mm-hmm. to break apart, but you can still walk around them and still get things done and still keep moving forward as a, as a people. So. And so let me, let me ask you this, because I also think that this is an important, important part of the story. Whenever you're looking at black communities outside of whatever community you come from, as far as Sweden is concerned, um, where, where are the, where's the black and brownness coming from? So is it coming from yes. immigration? And if it's coming from immigration, what type of immigration? So are they coming from the yes. Caribbean, Africa? You're what, like, where, where is it coming from? So, so most of the black, so I'll start with black, are coming from East Africa. Oh, okay. So most of them are from East Africa, so, so Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, mm. and then a big section from Gambia mm. and Senegal. And then, uh, you know, the brown uh, are from the Middle East, you know, because of all what happened. And so Sweden has opened its doors a lot to a lot of refugees. And in that sense, you know, you say thank you that it helped save people. But in another sense, there isn't a great integration policy because you cannot put people in a corner. Mm. People actually want to contribute to society and work. And then when people actually meet all your milestones, you keep moving the milestones. Like before you can do this, you need to learn the language. Okay, now I know the language. Well, before you know the language, you have to do this. Okay, now I do it. And you keep moving that. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with Sweden with the integration. Mm. So that's kind of where the, the... uh, people are coming from. And then because it's also an insular society, a lot of the communities stay together because it's not a culture that... And, and this is this is why it's good to know the mindset mm-hmm. because what started out as mindfulness, it's a, it's a culture that doesn't like stress, mm-hmm. right? So what it does is it tries to not stress its neighbor. It gives you your space. Okay. You know? And, and it first of all does it out of mindfulness, Right, like I'm giving you space. I don't want to stress you. That is also why, when COVID happened and the social, it's already a socially distant society anyway. Yeah. So people are thinking it's fine. Yeah. But then what happens is that morphs from distance to actually lack of acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. Where because they are giving people actually then no longer acknowledge you. Mm-hmm. They no longer look at you or acknowledge your problems. They just kind of give you. And so that is a lot of problems, causes a lot of problems, especially when you're coming from a society or culture 
that's very warm and like, hey, I'm mad, I'm mad, how are you doing? Like you're very, and then you come into a culture that's a lot more reserved. Mm-hmm. Then you feel like, is it me? Mm. Without really fully understanding it might be the cultural mindset. Mm-hmm. It may not actually be you. It's just that <laughs> they're just giving you. Mm-hmm. So there's so many nuances to kind of sift through to figure out, okay, when is it just a cultural mindset? When is it ju- like flat out racism? When is it, mm-hmm. you know, so. And is the, the uh, because I didn't know this, the, the Eastern African migration, has that been tied to because of conflict or political strife? Or yes. has it just been, you know, that just happened to be the place where those individuals would go? Most of it is always tied to like maybe civil wars or conflicts or different things in the regions. And so that's why, like I said, Sweden is used to, we need to protect, you know, and that's the mindset. And then they go protect people without fully giving people agency, saying, okay, we're protecting you. You you have to be thankful. We we helped you. Yes, you have to be grateful for the rest of your life. But you're like, yes, I am grateful, but... I'm also a human being with thoughts. I want to contribute. I want to do this. I want to thrive. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's the problem is there's a difference between thriving and just surviving. Mm-hmm. You know, and so so in that sense, it can be very difficult to criticize because on the one hand, it's doing many great things in terms of helping people and trying to get people, you know, to have a chance at a better life. But then at the same time, it's not limiting people's potential to try mm-hmm. to fully be themselves because then you have lots of lawyers and doctors and people that came from their countries that can even after they study even after they do everything they still get the lowest jobs and are not allowed to thrive to fully thrive mm. is sweden outside of the groups we've just talked about is sweden predominantly homogenous I would say so, because I would say about 25% of the population is foreign born or has at least a foreign parent. But that does not mean all black or brown. It could mean like a foreign parent is French, right. white, right. you know, right. you know it's part of that 25%. But um, yeah, but at least 25% of, so one in every four Swedish kind of resident has some foreign ties. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's that's bigger than I than I even was conceptualizing. Yeah. And so, yes. yeah, I mean, and I think it then becomes an interesting society now as, you know, as those groups start to stay, it also starts to change yes. the landscape. Cause I would also imagine when you start to look at the population, people intermarry and, yes. and, and then, you know, because the, co- the conversation I always have with black folks going somewhere is once again, hair care. <laughs> <laughs> Where can I get my hair care? And it's always a sign of how a place has changed when all of a sudden there's shops yeah. that cater to, to black hair. Exactly, exactly. But, but you know what I always say, though, is like, uh, and, I, and I wrote this in the book as kind of like a tongue-in-cheek thing, is that one of the things that my one of my characters loved about living in Sweden is she could carry her hair matted beyond recognition and nobody would notice because, you know, black hair, like, for example, if she had braids, she can carry it like six weeks longer than oh, yeah. normal because in the because in the US, right away the other black people that will say, "Hey, what's going on there?" Get your right. Head but in Sweden, nobody Nobody's really like, kind of cares, <laughs> look at you, acknowledge you that way. So, you know. Oh my gosh, it's, <laughs> man! <laughs> what a, you know, so I will say, Sweden is is on one of my travel to do lists. I feel like my travel list is sure. it's gotten long. It's ah. gotten longer since COVID, right? And, and the funny yes. part is. I don't think I've done a pro. So I, I say this, I said this earlier. I haven't done a proper <laughs> London trip, which is a whole segment yes. in another podcast, uh-huh. which is funny. As much as I've traveled, I've been to Heathrow plenty of times and I've actually stayed in a hotel, but I haven't actually <laughs> gone into London as my, I've been all over oh. the world. Haven't gone in, but that's, oh, you should go. but Stockholm has, has really, has really intrigued me. And I've always thought, okay, I want to go when it's warm yes. and hopefully there's no snow on the ground. And I, in my mind, I'm like, there's snow all the time. And I know that's a lie. But no, but you should come. You should come to Sweden because I mean, Sweden is a lovely, like just when it comes to just the physicality of the, you know, I mean, I, I'm a travel writer. Yeah, of course. Photographer, so I write a lot about Sweden, you know, it, it's a beautiful place, you know, to visit and to spend some time, you know. So I mean, absolutely. you a good ambassador for somebody who wasn't even born there. Like you, <laughs> you I'm traveling. you're like a really good Swedish I'm, ambassador. <laughs> But that's the thing there is that, you know, because there are many parts of it I love. And then as there are many parts of it, I openly criticize, yeah. 
you know it's like a, it's a love it's a love kind of love it relationship but it's not but it's i won't say it's a love it relation it's a marriage yeah right you have to be able to thrive you have to be able to love each other but you have to also be able to criticize and want the best for each other you know <laughs> so yeah so so let's let's talk about this let's talk about your travel work so you have taken some gorgeous photos and i as i was looking through some of your work in the past i was trying to think about how did you even get to that point right so we talked about what you did you know in information systems and geography and whatnot but how did you how did you make the transition and that's not the only thing you've done but into travel mm-hmm. photography and 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 really transition that as a career like how did you get there yes so, I mean, like I said, I've always loved traveling. It's always been kind of part of my life. And when I used to travel on vacation, I used to take pictures and come back to paint from the pictures. Just And then I was like, you know what? I feel like I'm doing too much with this. Like, can I just explore, you know, photography as an, another medium to express? And then it was in 2002, I volunteered with an expedition race. We were three weeks in Fiji in the remote <laughs> jungle parts of Fiji. And I was there in actually in, standing in a river, kind of tie deep. And I was like, what am I doing here? This is the most amazing thing. And, and I'm supposed to take pictures and write about it and post it every day <laughs> online. <laughs> so when I came back, you know, I started plotting, you know, and I was like, you know what? What's the biggest goal within travel photography? It's National Geographic. I grew up in those. You know what? I'm a storyteller. I love telling stories. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply. Why not? And so what happened is very early on, I became audacious, mm. right? A lot of people say we have imposter syndrome. Everybody has imposter syndrome. Yeah. But what you believe is you believe in your voice. Mm. If you believe that you have a unique voice and you have a story to tell, what's the worst that could happen? They just ignore your email. But the best that could happen is that they say, you know what? I like the story idea. Let's explore it. And that is how I kind of started. I was very audacious in the beginning. I had no clips, no references, no nothing. I'll just take a picture and say, you know what? I have this photo essay idea. That's how I pitched the BBC. They ran some of my photo essays, you know. And then with National Geographic, at the time, they had a community called Your Shot, where you just submit your photos. And I think it got picked by the editors three times. And then that was when I knew that, okay, my my photos have the, their own voice. The fact that they can see and the photo is saying something. So that's kind of how it started. And, you know, once you get the first one, then it kind of snowballs. But I think it all starts with being audacious, mm. or being audacious, having a point. And I always say with photographers, we all have our different niches. You know, people are landscape photographers, street photographers, a travel photographer, you should have your niche, but you should also have to be able to photograph everything because you're telling a story. Mm-hmm. And so that's what, and that's why, you know, I've seen a lot of very frustrated landscape photographers. They can't get where they want to be mm-hmm. because landscapes is not just a story of a destination. The destination is the landscape, the people, the street, the food, the details, everything together to tell a story. So it's all about storytelling. Mm visually for me. So. And I, I'm I'm passionate about storytelling. I I actually so I had a client the other day, has nothing to do with travel or anything. But it was I was coaching her through the interviewing process, like for a job. Yes. And I said at the end of the day, all we're doing in this life is telling a story. Yeah. Like when you're looking for a job, you're telling a story, a cohesive story about who you are, right? When you are a content yeah. creator, you should be telling a story. Right. When, yes. Because whenever we see something that we can connect with, right, we're like, oh, my gosh, I want to learn more. And so I love the fact that you talk that it's storytelling, even if it may look like it's a space that you don't tell stories, because you're right. I I don't seek out landscape photography, but when I see some really good photography, I want to know more and I learn more and exactly. I can, you get pulled in. And so which, what, what point in your career did you really just... Obviously, you've been a professional basically since you were 19, 20. At what point in your career did you just basically go from, all right, this is what I'm going to do. So you you maybe left the programming behind and yeah. said, I'm a creative, I'm a content creator. This is what I'm going to do. So when I, when I was programming, I wasn't stupid. So I was still doing stuff on the mm-hmm. side. As one <laughs> should. Because, because as you should, because one of the things I always say is, yes, life is short you know, jump 100% into your passion. 
But if you got bills to yeah. pay, you need to pay all those bills. And if you have responsibilities, it's a slow process from going from that past life to the new life. So when I was working as a programmer, I started freelancing on the side uh -huh. until I felt I'd built enough momentum to about 40% of my income. Mm. And then I took the jump. So that means I lost like 60% yeah. right away. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, you're moving to starving artist mode, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, gratefully, all that is, you know, being recouped, recouped over the years and much more. But, you know, it's once you do that jump, at least it wasn't into a void. It was into, I started building clips. I started getting my name out there. I started getting my voice out there. And, and then just going from there. And, and for me, I always say, if you know kind of what your purpose and your interest is, then you can navigate different spaces mm -hmm. and it will still draw you. So for example, for me, it's all about culture and connection, right? Mm -hmm. So in travel photography, that's what you see. Mm -hmm. In my writing, that's what you see. In my project, it's about that. So it, it just kind of guides you to the right projects you know, and feels cohesive. I think that what you just said, for, for those who are looking especially to be self-employed and entrepreneurs, I don't think I don't think that gets said enough. Because we do talk a lot about hustle and grind. I see this all the time on Twitter. Yeah. And and I think the fact that you said, look, I was doing this on the side with the job. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then had a proof of concept, i.e. people were interested in what I was working in. And then that's when I said, I'm all in, but I'm going to have to take a cut. Yeah. Because I think too often folks are like, especially, and I know this isn't the same thing, but especially when th people think about being a digital nomad. And they're like, oh, yeah. I can just move and I can start my own. But I'm like, all this takes work, baby. The stuff that you see yes. our website, <laughs> you see our website, <laughs> people getting up at yeah. 5 a.m. to do interviews. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, this is not, because yeah. I, I, I could see someone, well, I could see someone looking at you and saying, okay, they can be inspired, but also like, all right, let me just go yeah. ahead and just pick that camera and just go ahead and start and see what happens and make this money. And I'm like, you <laughs> have no idea. <laughs> No, but that's the thing because, and that's why I said, you know, you could be the best photographer because I know so many amazing photographers that just technically sound, but when you put their photos next to others, I can't tell them apart because it's technical perfection. Ah. You have no voice. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather see a photo that I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't like that photo. That's Jimmy's photo. Yeah. But you know yeah. what? It's Jimmy's photo. Right. That's where you want to be. Yeah. That's where you want to be as a photographer. Your photos should have their own voice. Mm. So that people can see it and say, you know what, I think it's this person's photo. It looks like, oh, I can see the person's style. But if it's very technically perfect, then I can't tell if it's Jason's or Mason's or this person's photo. Right. It's just all, you know. So. And at, at what point then, obviously, even you did and you've been doing photography for a long time. At what point did you start to transition and start going into writing books? Because I... At last count, I think you have three published and one coming out, which we've talked a little bit about. Yes. Um, but at what point were you like, you know what? I think I could compile this and 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 start to, you know, obviously have the photos, but do more formalized writing and kind of share that. Mm -hmm. So my the writing actually came first before the photography. Mm. So when I was actually in high school, I used to write. I was actually a fiction writer, wrote many fiction stories, and actually had my own little mini library where friends came and checked out the books. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, you oh, 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 your books? I can check out, yeah. These are all handwritten stories in all these little <laughs> and... books. I have 30 of them, 30 books. Wow. And so they were the sign-out sheet. <laughs> <laughs> this is why Nigerians like, come last, though, for real. This is ask me since that, you know. No, but, but you know, but I saw so fiction was always my thing. Mm. But then I got into nonfiction, which is a creative writing, which is a travel writing. When I went on that gotcha. expedition, I started writing, and and so the return to fiction as always is just natural. The writing actually comes. The photography. It's because I used to be an oil painter. I used to be an actually oil painting artist, you know, and so that brought the visual eye. And I always say, if you look at the photography, you can see it's kind of heavy handed in the editing. It's very, um, like, heavy contrast, yeah. heavy colors, heavy blacks, because I used to be an oil painter. That's what my eye sees when I edit, wow. <laughs> you know. So, but the writing came first. And so for me as an artist or as a creative person, I just choose the medium that, that I feel I need to communicate at that time. Mm. 
So for example, there was a time when I was just writing everything and then there's there's another time when I'm like, you know what, photos can communicate. Then another time, you know what, let me get my story out through fiction. Yeah. So it just depends. I see it as another medium of what you need to use best to to express yourself creatively at that time. And that's fascinating because I I didn't even realize that the fiction was probably your first starting point as a writer because obviously when I saw your 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 first couple of books they have been nonfiction and so it's actually yes. super cool to hear like you've kind of come back to your original writing style because I was going to ask yes. you well how did you transition to fiction you're like well actually <laughs> fiction is where I'm good at this just all came because of what I was doing and so yeah, what it, what has been the reception to to your books? Have, it, the ones that have come out so far, have, have people really engaged with them or have they, you know, yes. what do they tell you? I mean, for the first one, which I self-published, is called Do Not. And it won uh, in 2018 Best Travel Book from the American Association of Travel, you know, Society of Travel yeah. Writers. So that's a huge award and it's got... Lots of uh, great reviews. Mm -hmm. And then the one, Loa Gum, which is the one about Sweden, is in 18 different languages. I saw. So that's an international <laughs> best selling book. That, that it is is a good book. International. So yeah. let, let them know. This book is yeah. yeah, international. Yeah. <laughs> So the reception has been great, you know, for those two books. And I'm really looking forward to this, you know, um, you know the one, I, the fiction book I've got. I've contributed to many other books, like travel books as well. But this fiction one, I'm really, it's just, it's my heart. You know, I'm i am excited about it. I think it's going to share voices that are not often mm -hmm. heard in Scandinavia on a global scale. scale, And doing it in a way, and, and I say that Logum is the book that talks about the culture mm -hmm. objectively, the best parts and the, and the, and the um, underbelly. Mm -hmm. This book actually talks about, about okay, this is how it is to live in the underbelly mm -hmm. of the culture. So those books kind of work together, you know. So yeah, so I'm excited. And I, I mean, I am. I and I don't think we've even said the name. It's in every mirror, <laughs> she's black, right? Yeah, in every mirror, she's black. And I, I'm, I'm excited for this because just in general, I don't see we we don't see enough black and brown travel literature like where the mm. center of it is a non white individual. I've always, yes. I've said this a lot of times, part of the reason I think that also encourages people to go abroad or to live or travel is when you see yourself in the story and we don't see it in movies and we don't see it in, you know, movies and film, we don't see it. And, and we, I don't, we don't see it as much. I think mm. in books it's there but it's yeah. but especially in modern writing and so i think that you are you are claiming a space that we haven't even that could be so explored and so i'm excited and i know it's coming out in september and september is my birthday yeah. month so, oh great so, come out somebody go give me the book <laughs> And today, later today, in about two hours, we're going to go, you know, on social media to to uh, promote the, the, book. the book cover and everything and on the publisher so, site and everything. So later today. I am yeah, so excited for, for that. And but but here's the thing. So you're a writer, you're a creator, you're a mama, you're a photographer, you're doing all this stuff. And then I see towards the end of 2020, you're starting <laughs> local purse. And I'm like, okay, I know I'm busy, but the, the stuff that you doing is a little unreal. And so so many people have been impacted because of COVID. I mean, that goes without saying, but what was the mission behind that? And I know that you co-founded this initiative. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, just in the travel industry, the most impacted are the travel guides, you know, and the local artisans that depend mostly on tourism. You know, many of these artisans don't have e-commerce websites, you know, and, and so what we've we've done, you know, we're supposed to, we're actually supposed to launch this week, but we're going to launch next week is to create this live video shopping platform mm. where you can book with a local guide. They tr take you through like the market, they take you through kind of the cultural history and, and information like they do. That's the, what they are great at. And then they take you to meet a, a local artisan that shows you their work, that shows you the things you can buy. And then you can buy on the fly, meaning the guide and then take pictures of the thing, put the price, and then automatically on your own end, you can see it and add it to your cart. 
So it's like a live shopping thing. The guy creates a product, it comes to you, you just click to my cart. And so the, the, the thing that's been sitting heavy on my heart is I want us to move as fast as we can, mm-hmm. right? Because it's affecting people now. But we also have to move smartly, right? We have to make sure the platform is riding. We have to make sure that the people on the ground can handle the shipping. It's a whole new way of thinking, right? And we're, so we're trying to move fast. And then it's just me and my co-worker, uh, my co-founder, two of us, Sarah. You know, so... So it's, and we've got a partner that came on board, you know, in Trappy Travel, which I'm really grateful to. And so we're now in the process of onboarding people, you know, but then we have to make sure it's ready and stable and then they can start because it's going to, it's going to take a, it's a whole new way of communicating with the guides and with the artisans and they need to be able to move well with video and, and be different. It's not being a guide in person, it's being a guide online you know so but uh but we are launching soon you know very very it's like days kind of soon <laughs> so we're excited about it so. so by the time this is live it's gonna be up and and, and running yeah, it's gonna be and i yes. and i think when i saw kind of your first wave and, and stuff coming through you guys I, I, and i don't want to call it a test launch but was it morocco where it was the it was marrakesh yeah. it was marrakesh and we and um, and once we launch, we're going to launch with Marrakesh, and then we got other destinations. We're going to start onboarding like every two weeks and adding, you know. So, but uh, it was we did like a group broadcast yeah. just so people can test and have an idea of it. These ones are going to be more one on one, yeah. And then we're also going to do uh, broadcasts every month as well, different upcoming events. But in that Morocco test launch, we had. Just in two hours, because we had one hour one day and one hour the next day. One day was with spices, the other was with rugs. In just that one hour with just a few people, the guy sold seven rugs. <laughs> seven. <laughs> this is the first they are sold since COVID. Yeah. And rugs, I mean, when you travel, <laughs> most people don't you buy because, like one hour. Because you have to ship, and you also have to ship, figure out all the... Yeah. And also Moroccan traditional Beba rugs are not cheap. Yeah. So you can see how this can quickly impact, wow. you know, local artisans. So that's why we're trying to move. And so for me, it's like, I feel like I want to move faster, you know, but that's why we want to get it ready so that people can start going, you know, and then we're going to run, you know, multiple broadcasts as well, you know, kind of where we have different hosts. So it can really make a big impact. And so that's why we're, we want to, we're launching it, but at the same time, we want to make sure that it's also, um, stable and everything is ready. So, and and the fact that I mean, and I saw that, and I was like, I was doing something. But I'm like, something's really cool happening here. With- <laughs> I don't come across my screen, but the fact yeah. that you are thinking about the vendors, you're thinking about the artisans, and you're yes. and especially you're thinking about the people who are not traditionally engaged. And I and yes. I I know that you and I talked about this offline, but purposeful travel, right? And really thinking mm-hmm. about where you enter, and and we don't always have to be takers. We can also be contributors and, 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 and also allowing people to have their businesses with dignity too. Right. Because I think what you're providing is, Hey, if, if there are people who have the means and much of them would be Westerners, but they could also be wealthy Easterners or Southerners or whatever, have the means to buy from many of these great vendors. You're supporting them. You're supporting their family. You're supporting the economy. And you're getting a great product, and 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 I yes. this vision. You're right. It's something that I haven't seen as much as I see in the travel space. And I'm thinking to myself, <sighs> they got something here. And so, yes. when do you? No, so, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, and, and that's why we're really. I mean, we're trying. Like we're moving as fast as we can with just two people. You yeah, know? and we are trying to get funding as well. Yeah. You know, trying to get grants, and because we don't have an investor at the moment, right. you know, and so we're really. And what makes us also unique is we are two women, uh, women of color founders. Yeah. You know, Sarah, she's from Iran. I am from Nigeria, and and I also feel like that also impacts us. Yeah. Because if it was a white guy that already had the means, like they would have quickly gotten their funding quick and be moving. Right. But it's us, right. you know. Right. And so and, and we're coming up with this idea to really help. And so those are the things that also makes it very challenging for us is to move but also move as women of color, first women and then women of color in this space, you know? Um, so, yeah. I'm going to drop the, um, like I, I told you offline, I'm going to drop the link both in our show notes and on our website, because I think that 
one, this is an initiative that people should really look into, especially also you get good products. Like it's not like, you know, you're looking at something and you may connect with a product that you didn't even think you could get. But I think more importantly, for those who may even be interested in potentially investing, because there might be some folks within our, our, in our audience who are like, you know what, this is something that I would love to put some money in because it is, you are doing it differently. And when I say it's not a concept I've really seen anywhere, that means it's really something that it's needed. And there's so many, there's so much more good (laughs) that can come out of this. And so, um, like I said, Mm -hmm. you know, people ask me all the time, where do I find the hours in the day? I'm asking you, I don't even, (laughs) you are doing like at least one more project than I am. I'm like, I need to write a book real quick. (laughs) So I can at least be on your level of busyness. (laughs) Oh my goodness! Um, that's probably why I'm also under a bit under the weather. Is my body yeah. saying you need a break? Stop. Why? Why? I don't know why are you doing too much work for what? You know, but uh, but I'm that kind of person that once I'm passionate about something, it's very difficult to dampen my passion. Same. So I just keep on it. You know, you, you know, you know. Same. It is. So. Yeah, so definitely. so here's what I, I like to close off with. Um, I like to ask these three lightning round questions. Um, it's really stuff that you say off the top of your head. <laughs> you don't have to think deep about okay. it. It's, you know, not okay. deep and reflective, but just gives us a little bit more insight. So, first question: If you have never had Swedish cuisine before, what's the very first thing you should try? Oh, something called gravlax. So it's gravlax, gravlax in Swedish. It's um cured salmon. <laughs> So it's not smoked salmon, which is called lox in the US. Yeah. It's not that. This is actually not as salty. It's actually sweet with a little bit of mustard. And then they serve it with kind of round yellow almond potatoes <laughs> and a mustard sauce. Sounds really good. <laughs> Grab lox. Yeah. Those potatoes and that sauce, I could eat it every day. <laughs> I love salmon. So I'm just like, oh, uh-huh. somebody should it's good me stuff. or I have to come to Sweden. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, you have you have obviously done photography in a lot of different places. Out of everywhere you've been, what has been the most memorable photography experience you've had? Oh, that is a difficult, difficult one. I mean, I've had I'm being grateful to visit some amazing places like I mean Greenland, the Faroe Islands, Uzbekistan, you know, Tanzania. I mean I don't know. It's difficult to say. I mean, it really that is. It really is. <laughs> but, but I would say but I would say just there's something about I, mean, I have photographed the Northern Lights, like you know, proper photograph, you know, for publications and stuff. And just those are amazing. Just being there and being up, you know, and learning, you know, from the indigenous Sami communities there, up in Northern Sweden. That's that's amazing as well. But just even watching the Northern Lights and then catching all that display, that's something. But yeah, no, I've been to some many amazing places and met some many amazing people. Man, okay, you're you're. Your little list earlier, I was like, ma'am, that list right there. <laughs> I was like, Greenland, where's my Greenland? Uh, <laughs> Arrow <laughs> Islands, what? <laughs> okay. I mean, that was, that was real chill. And uh-huh. I mean, this is kind of a, this is just a, this is not even part of my lightning round question, but now that you said something, I was curious. How long do you typically go when you're, when you're on assignment? How long are you gone? So it, so it really depends. It really depends. It could be anywhere from three to four days to sometimes two weeks. But I usually try to keep them short because I have a young family. So I don't go that long, you know, and if I have to go long, I break the trip. Up. But uh, yeah, I'll say my trips are usually three, four, five days max. And that's what I was wondering because yeah. I knew I knew you've got with having a young child that <laughs> mama can't. Yeah, so that's when I'm going on assignment, you know, then I, I make them really short and snappy. <laughs> Number three, I always I always ask this. Well, I ask this question of a lot of folks. If if you guys didn't live in Sweden, where else in the world would you live? Oh my goodness, I love Nigeria, but <laughs> I love you. But um, I would actually just go live out in the Pacific Islands, South Pacific Islands, and just island up Tonga, Samoa, Vanuatu, all those places. I'll just live out there and just be island up in. You sound like me. I've I've said this on many podcasts. My behind would go back to Seychelles and not come back. There we go. 
I love the Seychelles. It's amazing. Thank I just you, because you've been. Oh, okay. Everybody else kind of looks at me, <laughs> and they're, they're like, I want to go. Amazing. You've been. Amazing. Uh, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the water, you look at the water, you know, and it's, it's just it's unreal. I mean, one of actually my favorite photos was I was there on assignment, and I went out around 6 a.m. with fishermen. Oh, yes. To... Yeah, to go pick to get the yeah. fish, and it was just one of the most amazing surreal. It, it is amazing. My my when I went out, I went out with my family and my my cousin, who's really funny <laughs> and very very Cameroonian. <laughs> I mean, my family is very Cameroonian, but he's really Cameroonian. Came out, and we were in Seychelles, and he's like, "Ah, this is not Africa. How is this Africa?" I'm like, <laughs> "It's part of the yeah, continent." Just because what you're used to seeing as exactly. <laughs> <African> chaos. <laughs> I know, right? I know. And I'm just a, I'm just a seafood. Oh my and gosh! Just a, it was the sand, and oh, it's 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 beautiful. It is. Beautiful, I, beautiful to place. the point, my sister asked, "So, how does one get real estate out here?" So she was serious about it. <laughs> she was serious about it. But oh my gosh, Lola, thank you so much for your time. I. You, Thank you. You know, I, I, it's nice to see how much your journey has continued on since you were first, I think, on the site in 2018. And so um, I am excited for your book coming out, as we mentioned earlier, In Every Mirror, She's Black is coming out in September of this year and will be available yes. in a, on Amazon for sure. And I'm sure in some other places. So I want everyone to check that out as well as your website for the local purse. And so what is the exact website for that? So for local, it's just localpurse.com, you know, and you can find everything there. And uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll have that. And then of course you are all over social media. And so if, <laughs> if y'all can, this is what y'all need to do. Just copy and paste her name. Cause I know some of y'all be like, I can't write this down right now. <laughs> copy and paste her name from this, from this episode and just throw that thing in Twitter, <laughs> Facebook and Instagram. And she gonna come up because I don't think there are very many people who have at least all three of her names. And so thank, thank you again for, for coming on to the oh, podcast. Thank you so much. And, thank you. I have so much fun and the pleasure was mine. Thank you. And so once again, thank you guys for listening in. Until next time. The Global Chatter with the Black Expat is hosted by me, Amanda Bates. It is produced by Justin Williams. You can find the show wherever you get your podcast or follow us on our YouTube channel at The Black Expat Presents.